If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Many of us have certainly heard this quote, but have you ever thought that this also applies to the journey of rockets? Indeed, as powerful as SpaceX's Starship may be, it won't be able to make it all the way to the moon, never mind Mars, all by itself. To get into orbit and then continue its journey, each Mars or moon-bound Starship will have to meet up in orbit with its brethren in order to fuel up for the journey beyond Earth. This is also the biggest challenge for the Starship program. So, how exactly do they fuel each other? The last half century has witnessed unprecedented growth in our understanding of space, both as a frontier and a domain of endless opportunities. Yet, as with any frontier, there are challenges and barriers that must be overcome. One such challenge is the current limitation of space vehicle endurance and mobility. The Elon Musk solution? In space, refueling or refueling in orbit? Why in space refueling is a game changer? The most obvious benefit of refueling is the ability to extend mission duration. Spacecraft, whether satellites, crewed missions, or probes, are constrained by their fuel capacity. Once its fuel is expended, the mission ends and the satellite often becomes space debris. Refueling allows these assets to extend their operational life, making missions more flexible and cost-effective. Currently, spacecraft must carry all the fuel they will ever use from the moment they launch. With refueling, spacecraft can instead be designed for increased payload capacity and more capable scientific instruments, thereby fundamentally increasing their value-generating potential. In space, refueling can be especially boon for deep space exploration. As we set our sights on destinations like Mars and beyond, the capability to refuel vehicles on their journey becomes a strategic advantage, reducing the need for excessively large and heavy launch vehicles. The first goal of Starship is to reach the Moon and even further, to Mars or other deep space locations. With significant distances involved in space travel, spacecraft will always require large amounts of propellant for their extended journeys. More importantly, with a reusable rocket, the majority of the fuel is typically consumed by the turbocharger in the spacecraft during the launch to reach orbit. At this point, there is usually only a limited amount of fuel remaining for the spacecraft to perform an atmospheric aerobrake, utilize a parachute, or the belly flop maneuver and land. This necessitates the need for in-orbit refueling of the Starship during the extensive journey to ensure an adequate fuel supply for propulsion. It would be similar to gas stations along the road when we travel from one place to another. Or if you've got a Tesla, you know, like a supercharger. The refueling process begins with the launch of a partially fueled Starship from the Earth's surface. Once in orbit, another Starship is sent to rendezvous with the first spacecraft. This carefully choreographed dance of two Starships, maneuvering in space marks, a departure from the conventional approach of launching fully fueled vehicles from the ground. When the two starships are docked or connected, the propellant will then be transferred from the refueling vessel to the target spacecraft. This is called the modified side-to-side -side fueling method, as opposed to the previous end-to-end -end or colloquially coined butt-to-butt -butt fueling method. This alternative fueling maneuver aims to address potential challenges and improve the stability and efficiency of the process. The side-to-side -side refueling mechanism deviates from the previous design's reliance on a balance advantage, where fluids flow downwards with a slight eulogy push in one direction. By switching the propellant full drain lines to the side, SpaceX aims to achieve a more practical and effective refueling operation. With large enough pipes, on the order of 2050 chem or 820 in, connecting each Starship's tanks, SpaceX should have no trouble transferring 1,000-plus tons of propellant in a handful of hours. Ultimately, that means that settled propellant transfer, even at the scale of Starship, should incur a performance tax of no more than 2050 tons of propellant per refueling. All transfers leading up to the worst-case 1,600-ton scenario should also be substantially more efficient. Overall, that means that fully refueling an orbiting Starship or depot with 1,200 tons of propellant, requiring anywhere from 8 to 14-plus tanker launches should be surprisingly efficient, with perhaps 80% or more of the propellant launched remaining usable by the end of the process.
While this refueling concept offers a fresh perspective and potential advantages, there are still several issues that need attention and resolution for a more successful outcome. For example, the ability to transfer highly volatile substances in the microgravity environment of space. Liquid oxygen and liquid methane are between spacecraft in orbit. Methane and oxygen need to be stored at extremely low temperatures to maintain their liquid state, which requires advanced insulation and cryogenic systems. While the concept holds immense potential for enabling long-duration missions and expanding our presence in space, the lack of comprehensive testing poses a significant hurdle. To achieve successful refueling at the required scale, it is crucial to establish protocols and technologies that guarantee efficient and reliable propellant transfer between vehicles. To solve this problem, SpaceX has actively collaborated with NASA to secure funding and develop essential components, such as cryogenic fluid couplers. These couplers serve as critical interfaces that allow the transfer of propellants between spacecraft. Furthermore, connecting two rockets in orbit is a complex task that requires precise coordination and maneuvering. The sheer magnitude of this endeavor, involving two massive spacecraft moving at high speeds in the vacuum of space, poses significant challenges. That's why ensuring a successful connection and transfer of propellant between the two starships demands exceptional engineering, navigation, and communication capabilities. SpaceX has also demonstrated its expertise in orbital rendezvous and docking through the crew Dragon spacecraft's successful missions to the International Space Station. The experience gained from these missions, where the crew Dragon autonomously docks with the ISS provides a valuable foundation for SpaceX to tackle the challenge of connecting two starships in orbit. The company's track record of reliable docking operations serves as a testament to its capabilities in overcoming intricate space maneuvers. Finally, how many launches will SpaceX need to refuel a starship to the Moon and Mars? SpaceX estimates that 1,200 tons of fuel, consisting of both liquid oxygen and methane, must be used to complete a lunar landing especially if it's supposed to be able to leave the Moon again. This means that Starship has to be refueled a total of 14 times in orbit to have enough fuel. During a launch, Starship uses most of its fuel to reach orbit after separation from the booster stage. But this plan has proven controversial in the space transport industry, as Blue Origin, owned by Amazon's Jeff Bezos, took exception to the Starship, potentially needing 14 launches to refuel in space. The company went so far as to blast the plan as preventing the U.S. from landing on the moon in a safe and sustainable way. Blue Origin then goes on to claim that SpaceX got preferential treatment when being selected for the Artemis program. This led to Elon Musk claiming in a tweet that the Starship will need only eight refuel rocket launches, and even just four if the Starship is only half full. Musk further elaborated that even if this required 16 refueling flights, it wouldn't be a problem. SpaceX's orbital flights will still happen more often than Jeff Bezos with the stationary blue feather. Of course, not to brag, but SpaceX is confident enough that the company's plans will take humans to the moon for the first time since 1972. For half a century, RP-1, liquid hydrogen, solid rocket, and hypergolic fuels were the propellant of choice for rocket manufacturers. But in recent years, liquid methane has become an attractive alternative for rocket propulsion. In its normal state, methane is a naturally occurring gas found in abundance within soil and rock sediments below the Earth's surface. The majority of it is created by the decay and breakdown of organic matter beneath the Earth's surface at high temperatures. In rocket propulsion, liquid methane is a cryogenic fuel used to power orbital rockets. The cryogenic fuel means the gas has to be cooled to temperatures of minus 162 Celsius or minus 260 Fahrenheit or below to turn into a liquid. Like all other fuels used in orbital rockets, liquid methane needs an oxidizer to combust. This comes in the form of liquid oxygen. The fuel and oxidizer are mixed in the combustion chamber, where they combust to form the hot gases that propel the spacecraft. For the Starship, SpaceX is switching to methane, which as fuel is somewhere between hydrogen and kerosene, 
Methane has a bit more specific impulse 370 seconds than kerosene 360 seconds in a vacuum at the same chamber pressure with a reference value of 7 MPa. But this is counterbalanced by RP1's lower bulk density, which is the density of fuel plus oxygen. Although the density of methane is 430 kg per cubic meter, it needs 3.5 parts of oxygen compared to 2.1 parts for RP1. Hence, the methane engine will carry less fuel but more oxygen by weight, around 20% larger tank than RP1. Coke formation temperature for methane is approximately double as high in the rocket chambers supporting the reusability of vehicles, while RP1 produces a chain of carbon and shoot particles that degrade the reusability of the rocket. On the other hand, liquid hydrogen is a popular first stage ignition with a specific impulse of approximately between 350 seconds and 540 seconds. This has also been used as second and further stage propellant if RP-1 was used as first stage fuel. Liquid hydrogen technology was considered a very important achievement by NASA because of the challenge of its cryogenic characteristics that require extreme care to handle its liquid form at minus 253 Celsius or minus 423 Fahrenheit. But now, the production of methane doubles every decade. External energy is not required, so methane does not need active cooling while passive cooling will work. While testing hydrogen propellant, considerable failure in components has occurred due to the process called hydrogen embrittlement. Various contact between gaseous hydrogen molecules and metal components at the temperature range minus 260 Celsius to more than 2000 Celsius creates uncertainties in the brittle character of the used component. Various metal hydrides are also produced, causing a critical problem. Expansive and laborious wall treatment of components can be avoided in the case of methane. Methane turbopumps are less complex than hydrogen turbopumps, which reduces complications in the plumbing of fuel. Honestly, liquid methane's characteristic is just a secondary reason leading to switching to methane of SpaceX on Starship. The point is that they want to manufacture this kind of fuel on Mars. In 2017, NASA launched its Artemis program with the aim of returning humans to the moon and establishing a base for further exploration of the solar system, including Mars, a project that is also the main focus of private aerospace companies like SpaceX. Taking all the fuel required for such a long trip will be impossible for any orbital rocket. Instead, scientists are looking to produce the fuel needed for the spacecraft on the planned destinations themselves which is where the real advantage of liquid methane comes in. If a production facility generating methane can be established on Mars, it will not only help to make interplanetary travel a more realistic endeavor, but also make it sustainable. If successfully implemented, Mars can also be used as a base for further exploration. Once SpaceX can produce its own liquid oxygen and is involved in making the methane, the cost in general will be cut down. Elon described oxygen as almost free. This is a future state statement where SpaceX will make massive solar-powered oxygen capture and liquefaction systems. Liquid oxygen is $40 per metric ton to distill from the air, $240,000 for 200,000 kilograms of the payload is $1.2 per kilogram or about $0.5 per pound. If SpaceX reduces the cost with the direct production of liquid oxygen and production of methane from natural gas, they could reduce fuel costs by half to $0.6 per kilogram or $0.3 per pound of payload. Labor and other non-fuel costs will be vastly lower for the SpaceX Starship because of the massively lower initial cost, limiting financing and interest costs, and because of vastly higher speed for more users each day. So, how will SpaceX produce methane on Mars? Researchers have devised a new way to create methane-based rocket fuel that they hope could make return trips from Mars far more feasible. This method was previously theorized by Elon Musk and engineers at SpaceX, who considered ways to use carbon dioxide and water from ice on Mars to have the necessary carbon and hydrogen necessary to create methane. In 2019, scientists released a new global map showing water ice that is as little as 1 inch or 2.5 centimeters below the red planet's surface. With data in hand, the research team located at least one promising landing spot for future astronaut missions, a big zone in the northern hemisphere's Arcadia Planitia. This area has a lot of water ice close to the surface and is in the ideal location for a human Mars mission because it is in a temperate mid-latitude region with plenty of sunlight.
the research team wrote in a new study describing the findings. Further study of the treasure map could unlock more landing locations too, according to NASA. Water is a precious resource for future astronaut missions to Mars, where the space agency wants to land in the 2030s. The hope is that instead of hauling all of the water astronauts will need from Earth to the Red Planet, astronauts could get their drinking water and the components of water containing oxygen and hydrogen for rocket fuel from Mars itself. So, in theory, future astronauts could use this technique to turn local Martian materials like ice and carbon dioxide to make rocket fuel for a return trip home. As far as I know, this new method is only a proof of concept right now, meaning it has only been tested in labs but not in real-world conditions. To create this new method, the team took an existing two-step method used to turn water into breathable oxygen on the International Space Station and made it into a one-step process. They did this using a single atom zinc catalyst. The zinc is fundamentally a great catalyst because it has time, selectivity, and portability a big plus for space travel. By narrowing a two-step process down to one step, it makes the mechanism more compact and portable, and thus easier to transport for use on Mars. This new method takes atomically dispersed zinc, which acts as a catalyst for the reaction, helping to create methane from carbon dioxide. The process, using this specialized catalyst, efficiently converts carbon dioxide into methane. Many launch vehicles today don't use methane-based rocket fuel so this process would have to be compatible with future propulsion technologies. However, some companies are already hopping on board to develop and use methane-based rocket fuel. For example, in addition to SpaceX's Starship Raptor engines and Blue Origin's BE-4 engine, there are also Firefly Alpha and a Chinese firm, namely Landspace Technology with its rocket SuQ Y3. And that just about wraps it up for today's episode. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification feature so you don't miss any space important updates. Your support is our driving force to continue delivering high quality content. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you next time.